you know, I've, I heard someone recently say that many Americans feel like they have come into, you know, they're watching a, a, a TV series, but they missed the first two or three episodes. And it does feel like that. And I think that's an area in which we in journalism have to do a lot better job. Uh, and now, to introduce our speaker today, Margaret Sullivan is the media columnist for the Washington Post, writing on journalism ethics, free speech, and the intersection of politics and the news media. Before joining the Post in 2016, she was the New York Times public editor, and previously the chief editor of the Buffalo News, her hometown newspaper where she started as a summer intern. She was the first woman to serve as managing editor and editor-in-chief of the news, as well as the first female public editor of the New York Times. A graduate of Georgetown University and Northwestern University's Medill School, she's a former member of the Pulitzer Prize Board, and was twice elected as director of the American Society of News Editors, where she led the First Amendment Committee. She has taught in the graduate schools of journalism at Columbia University and the City University of New York. In 2017, she won the Stephen Hamlet First Amendment Award from the New England First Amendment Coalition, recognizing her columns at the Times and the Post, the champion free speech and press rights. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Margaret Sullivan. So Margaret, you uh, you recently wrote about the term mainstream media that you were going to stop using that. Yes. Why? Well, I like the expre I I have an altern alternative that I like better, and the alternative I like better is the reality based press. <laughs> <laughs> so I I think that you know like the phrase fake news, uh, the term mainstream media has been weaponized, and. Um, and for that reason, I mean, I do still use it from time to time. I do not use fake news, but I do still say mainstream media from time to time because people understand what it means and it's a sort of shorthand. But I'm trying to point out that there is an element of the journalistic ecosystem that um, tries to hew to the facts and reality as opposed to some other things. What, uh, how, how do you think about or evaluate the news media's role here in covering Trump? How much time have you got? <laughs> um, you know, we're struggling, I would say, to, to cover a very unusual, abnormal president. Um, you know, we really haven't seen this, uh, he's, he is, um, and I think would would be the first to say that he's out to turn things on their heads to destroy norms and so on and yet the way we cover things tends to tends to be in a system that wants to put him into a normal sort of kind of coverage and so those things don't really go together very well and i don't think we've fully figured out how to change what we do in order to adjust to what he does. I mean, one of the things that we've done that actually has worked fairly well and has been a good development is a lot more, a, a lot more real-time fact-checking, which has been very necessary because Trump doesn't, uh, he, he doesn't tell the truth a lot and he tells a lot of uh, he uses a lot of misstatements, and I don't think it's going too far to say that some of them are actually lies. Um, so, and that's, you know, another, th that's, that's a good um, sort of avenue to discuss the way we cover him. It took, it took the reality-based press quite a while to use the, ex the word lie to talk about um, Trump's misstatements. You know, could we say that? Didn't that imply intention? Um, should we, you know, that's a very, certainly a very negative word. Should we do that? And I think uh, in some cases we have simply, you know, kind of thrown up our hands and said, well, you know, that we can call that a lie because it so clearly uh, isn't true and provably untrue and he really should know that. What, what about, you, you've written, I'm going to quote you, somehow the familiar cycle of freakout, shock, reaction, insult, rejoinder has to stop. 
Do you think Do you think that uh, journalists should stop covering the president's tweets, or how, how do we handle those tweets? Well, my feeling about covering the tweets is that we we cannot ignore them entirely because they are, uh, strangely enough, presidential statements of a sort. Um, but I don't think we have to react to each tweet as if it was a, a as if it were a five alarm fire. So um, and we do tend to overreact to them. But I don't think we can go over to the other side of that and say, well, we're only going to cover Trump when he's giving an official address or made a presidential statement of some kind. The, the, the tweets get out into the world and they could affect they could affect the stock market, they could affect they could cause a war, they could do a lot of things. We can't ignore them. What what do you what has surprised you most about your profession's approach to this president? Well, I mean, <laughs> I think that we've been, um, I think that we have been grappling with the constant stimulation, the constant news cycle. Um, I mean, wasn't January the longest month in history? You know, it just went on and on. It is a long month, um, and it's cold out. But, but it still seemed, I think the biggest problem and the one that, that, we haven't dealt with well is just the intensity, uh, the the constant, the way the news cycle is is so packed with with events. We're not doing a great job covering covering policy and substance. We are distractible, and I mean I don't know whether I'm surprised by that, but it is a problem. You. Uh you spent last summer living in upstate New York, and I just wonder what that was like to go from living inside the Beltway, being a part of the media and political elite, uh, uh, to to living, uh, you know, more directly in Middle America. Mm -hmm. You could say right. Well, I did this on purpose, um, and and partly because I it's it's not far from. Uh, my hometown and I had a place to live for for a few weeks but I also decided since I was going to be there that I would talk to um, I, I need a word for this too because sometimes I use the term ordinary Americans and I get chastised for saying that that's bad um, regular people you know I talked to people How about that <laughs> I talked to people I encountered um, about their feeling about the news media and their trust in the news media. And um, I, did, I got outside the Beltway on purpose to do that. And what I found was a little bit surprising. Um, the, the public opinion polls will tell you that there's very terrible uh, mistrust and distrust of the news media. And what I found was something a little different, a little more nuanced, which was that people, if you say, hey, do you trust the media? They will say no. The media is bad. But, but they actually feel kind of OK about their own news sources. So whether that happens to be the local newspaper, or whether it's NPR, or whether it's the New York Times, or something else, they actually, or Fox News in some cases, uh, they feel like they have access to information that they feel is credible. And so there's sort of this sense of there's the media, bad, and there's my media, yeah. not too bad. It's very similar to how people feel about Congress. They exactly. hate Congress. They love their member of Congress, right, in that sense. Also, what about, what, what did your experience there, what did you take away around polarization? One of my experiments is the president follows about 45 people on Twitter. <laughs> I put them on a list on Twitter, and some days I will only read what those people are tweeting, mm -hmm. and I'll watch Fox News, and I'll read Breitbart, and it's it's almost like a wholly distinct universe. It is, um, and that I think is is even more the case, uh, in, you know, in Washington, in New York, and and probably here as well. Um, I didn't find as much of that in in upstate New York, in western New York, it, it seemed as though people still had, you know, they were watching, you know, typically people would say, well, I read the Buffalo News and I watch Lester Holt at night. And, you know, they, there was a little bit more of a, 
uh, centrism to it and less tribalism. Um, and I do feel that the polarization and the tribalism of, of the news media and of the way people are reacting to the news media is the most discouraging and the most troubling thing that I've experienced since moving to Washington. Say a little more about that. Well, you know, I mean, just take this recent episode, which we now you have to cast your mind back, way back to two days ago, <laughs> um, you know, this sort of whole release the memo thing. Um, you know, I think that if you asked someone uh, who's not a, a journalist or in politics mm -hmm. to explain the issues there, they might have a hard time doing that, but they can tell you where they come down, you know, who they support. And so it's being reacted to in a purely, almost purely <coughs> partisan way without under really much understanding of the underlying issues, which, you know, are, are complicated. I, uh, you know, I've, I heard someone recently say that many Americans feel like they have come into, you know, they're watching a, a, a TV series, but they missed the first two or three episodes. And it does feel like that. And I think that's an area in which we in journalism have to do a lot better job. Hmm. What, you know, part of, it seems like, to your point there about the TV, sh it seems like part of the problem is that, uh, is, is, this, is this intersection of celebrity and news, right? Which in many ways is predates Trump. He's almost like a natural expression of it in a, in a sense. And I wonder what you, you know, if you have any thoughts about the role that celebrity culture is playing in all this and in both kind of isolating the moment and, and in a very crowded media mm -hmm. landscape as a way of focusing attention. Right, first I wanna say that the person who has made that clever uh, observation about TV shows and all was Julia y Yaffe, um, who writes for The Atlantic, so I don't want to steal her thunder there. She said that on Brian Stelter's show the other day. Um, well, I think that when we saw the reaction to uh, Oprah Winfrey uh, at the Golden Globes and all of a sudden she should be considered a, uh, a strong candidate for, for president, you know, that speaks to just what you're talking about, that, you know, you start to wonder, can, can anyone be president anymore without, without being something of a celebrity before they get to that point? And I, I don't think that we're there yet, but you know, Trump has changed the game in so very many ways that I'm not sure how all of that is going to play out except that we're never going back to where we were. There's a terrifying thought. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, I wanna uh, maybe, uh, change gears away from Trump for a moment and talk about... We can't. We have to talk it, about Trump that, always. That's the requirement? That's the, yes, yes, it's yes. the only thing that can be discussed. An edict of the Washington mm -hmm. Post newsroom? <laughs> every uh, newsroom. Every newsroom, yeah. Um, I want to just to ask you a little bit about the Me Too movement. And, you know, this, this weekend, Maureen Dowd, of course, uh, wrote about her series of interviews with Uma Thurman. And I, I just want to you to, from your perspective, from your role both at the New York Times and the Washington Post, what, what kind of challenges does the news media face in covering issues of sexual assault and violence against women? It's, well, so it's a very tricky subject for, for everyone in our society, but, but the news media is struggling with it in, in part because so many of the highest profile cases that we've read about and heard about are taking place inside our either our own newsrooms or newsrooms of places that we know very well whether that's you know NPR or the New Yorker the New York Times and there is a case at the Washington Post so um, as journalists were trying to scrutinize this whole subject Hollywood um, and politics you know Congress and we're also dealing with situations inside our own newsrooms, and it's it's extremely uncomfortable. It's it's hard to deal with. Um, you want to be fair to everyone involved. You know, you certainly don't want to um, proceed without something resembling mm -hmm. due process. Um, I would say that in in the cases I know about, um, the 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 situation has been handled thoughtfully inside newsrooms, and there has not been a rush to judgment that I have seen. Um, but, you know, 
the New York Times led the way on this. The New Yorker also helped to lead the way on it. And I think the work that has been done has been extremely important. It's been a, one of the, the biggest and, in general, most positive changes that our society has seen. It's, it's monumental. And at the same time, it's, it comes with its own share of, of troubles and problems and decisions and nuances. Although, you know, uh, the Women's Media Center and their research really shows that in, in some ways, uh, American newsrooms are less representative gender-wise than they were uh, 15 or 20 years ago. So when I was named executive editor of the Buffalo News, uh, there were 13 women, I was, I was the 13th woman at that time among the top 100 circulation papers in the country. 13 out of, what, what out of was that? it was, 2000, late 1999 or 2000. Um, and so out of the top 100 newsrooms in the United States, 13 of them were led by women. Correct. Um, and I don't know what that is right now. I, I, I suspect it's a little better. Um, but I would say, and this, uh, this has to do with the Me Too movement as well, that having women in powerful positions is is helpful with all of this because so often sexual harassment and sexual assault in the workplace is a power dynamic as much as it is a sexual dynamic. Hmm. Uh, I want to go back for a moment to talk about Twitter and Twitter's role in news coverage and in reporting. And you know, sometimes I I think that uh, our entire news media ecosystem would be better off without Twitter. And I wonder what you think of the way Twitter influences the way stories are reported, uh, the, the harassment journalists face. You know, last year we had um, your uh, a colleague at the Washington Post. Um, uh, help me out. Oh, help me out. Uh, <laughs> investigative reporter. Uh, David Farenthold. David Farenthold here. And David does incredible stuff. He really kind of crowdsources his investigative reporting on Twitter. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if he would be able to do that if he wasn't a white male, if the harassment he might face mm -hmm. as an investigative reporter pursuing Trump and Trump's business deals and philanthropy on Twitter might face a very, he might face a very, he might face a very different digital climate. Right. Right. And so uh, I kind of, I feel like on the one hand, Twitter seems to empower him and there's a, there's a way it looks to me almost as if, um, as if engaging with the public on Twitter has replaced engaging with the public in other venues for mm -hmm. a lot of journalists. Mm -hmm. And that leads to a, a kind of a distorted and dystopian view of what the public is. So uh, there's a lot to talk about, I think, in terms of Twitter's role in the way we report stories and the way stories get shared. Well, it, I mean, one interesting thing about journalists on Twitter is they seem to feel much more um, able, whether they should or not, to be snarky, to be critical, to say things that seem partisan um, in that setting than they would in their news stories or their regular work. Um, and I think that's unfortunate. Um, everybody is trying to sort of have a brand that works for them in social media. And, and you can't be bland in doing that. You know, you sort of have to be pointed or clever or something like that. And I, I you know, I think that that help, it adds to the sense that people have that that we're uh, that we have this attitude of being smarter than our audiences and snarky and not very nice people and not very trustworthy. So I think it actually diminishes uh, it diminishes trust. I do think that it can be a really rough, I know that it can be a very rough place to be a woman. Um, uh, it's, you know, people oddly go immediately to very insulting, sexist language when they don't agree. Oh, I have found this to be the case. When, when people don't agree with something that I'm saying, they'll, they'll go right away to um, very derogatory language about, uh, you know, I don't want to say these words <laughs> here, but think of the worst words you can don't say about say a woman. I'm not going to say them, but you know, there it's and it's it is uh, it is it is very discouraging and it's mm. and it's very difficult to deal with. So, um, but it's 
at least for now, it's it's here to stay. It's a bulletin board for news. It's a way that people distribute their work, and it's become an important part of you know the, uh, of the journalistic sphere. To what extent do you think the platforms, the like Twitter and Facebook and Google, you know, have a uh, a, a special responsibility to the public sphere, in you know. One way to think about this is that, you know, newspapers and magazines had a, and even television and radio, news newsrooms had, uh, it took them a while to develop it, for sure, but they developed real norms and standards mm -hmm. in a sense of being custodians of of the public, in a, right. in, in a sense. And I wonder to what extent that, that, that stewardship of the public sphere is really owned by the platforms now. And, well, I think the yeah. platforms have been very reluctant to see themselves as what they are, which is media companies. They don't, they, you know, Facebook is the best example of this. Facebook does not want to see itself as a media company, even though it is one. Um, because, you know, for example, people are uh, filming, uh, you know, sh shootings on Facebook with Facebook Live. They're they're creating news on it. They're doing all kinds of things. And Facebook constantly makes editorial decisions. But they will never say, we're making editorial decisions. I mean, at one point, Facebook decided that, according to its community standards, <coughs> that the famous um, photograph, Pulitzer winning photograph of the napalm girl in Vietnam was child pornography. And they took it down. And um, and then after protests, they put it back up, and I think there was a whole cycle around that. That's clearly an editorial decision, and yet they, you know, Facebook will never say, "Well, we actually do make editorial decisions, and we have to own that." And that's true uh, of well, others as well. Well, I think what Google would say, I don't, I don't know that Facebook would say this, but what Google would say is, "Well, decisions are made algorithmically." And some of those decisions may be editorial decisions, but they're not made by humans. They're made by algorithms looking at data, and that there's integrity in that process. Mm. Well, I mean, I, I don't really buy that. And I think that, um, that algorithms are a function of human decisions, and that has to be owned. Yeah, arguably the sum of human decisions. Mm -hmm. um, I want to I wanna continue on this vein a little bit and think about and ta ask you about free speech. In, in the fall, we have something called the Salant Lecture on the Freedom of the Press, and Jamil Jaffer from the Knight First Amendment Center at Columbia gave it, and he raised a very intriguing line of uh, argument that the greatest danger facing free speech isn't really censorship, but in some sense the inverse of almost too much speech. Mm. Uh, and this began with a piece Tim Wu wrote, I, I believe. And I wondered what you thought about that idea that the greatest danger to free speech is actually the volume of speech, especially when it's misinformation, disinformation, hate speech. So there's, you know, I, I'm familiar with the lecture and I know Jamil, um, and so I, I do understand this line of thinking, and I think it's very smart to think about it that way. Um, certainly the founders, um, it, when, when the First Amendment was, was written, could never have anticipated the Internet. And like so many things that the Internet has turned on its head, I think the Internet has turned free speech issues on its head, on, on their heads. And so, uh, yes, that's, that's true that disinformation as opposed to censorship is probably um, an issue that we need to pay a lot more attention to, and I, I think he's onto something. And, and it's uh, in so many spheres, including legally, uh, we haven't fully come to terms with this. You know, we're, we're, we're still in the infancy of all of this. Uh, you know, when you think that Twitter, for example, has been around, I think, since 2006, um, you know, Zuckerberg was at Harvard not too long ago. Yeah. Um, so it's all very new, and we're, we're still dealing with it. Uh, I'm going to open it up to questions in a moment, but I have one, uh, I have a couple more, I have one really, one more question before I open it up. I actually have a dozen, but <laughs> I feel like obligated to share the, share the wealth here. <laughs> um, so progressive of me. The, um, 
when you look at the you know when you look at your your job and your beat and looking at the media and its coverage of culture and politics you know what what is your what do you think the greatest challenge facing your profession is facing journalism yeah. generally I mean, the, the, to me, the biggest problem in journalism right now is the demise of local newspapers. Um, and even though people probably, a lot of people would say, well, the biggest problem that, that journalism has right now is that, you know, Trump is threatening free speech and, you know, all of that. And, and, I, and I do worry about that. I think that actually a much bigger problem is that the business model of local newspapers throughout the country has has pretty much disintegrated. And while the papers are still there, they're much weakened, they're much smaller, their, their news hole is smaller, their staffs are smaller, and that's only going in one direction. And I don't think that we have um, dealt with that very well. Yes, we have a few situations in which a very rich person has come along and, and bought the, the newspaper, but in most communities, uh, papers increasingly are owned by chains, sometimes uh, private equity firms. They're not interested in the journalism and, or, the uh, or the community. And they are reaping their profits while they may. And, you know, it, if we have any hope of having, um, of, of having some kind of agreement on the facts I think local journalism is, is, because it tends to be trusted, you might run into that reporter in the grocery store and you know you know these people. There's an, a kind of an inherent trust. Um, when that goes away, we lose an awful lot and I find that to be the most distressing situation out there. Yeah, I'll just note that a Pew study from 2015 showed that 21 U.S. states used to send local news correspondents to D.C. and no longer do. And so that's 21 U.S. congressional delegations, 42 U.S. senators who don't get questions from hometown papers in D.C. anymore. And I'll tell you, I think that's bad, but I think what's worse is the, is the demise of state house bureaus, which has happened over, uh, you know, at, a, at a greater rate of speed than, than the staff declines in newsrooms generally. So, I mean, a lot of the important news for a community happens at the state level, and accountability and watchdog journalism is extremely important there, but those are being abandoned. That's bad. On that warm note, I'll Sorry. open it up to further questions. We've so far, I think in 30 minutes, covered an exhilarating breadth of topics from Trump and celebrity journalism, polarization, Me Too, Twitter platforms, free speech, and local journalism, uh, and I, it's, I have to say, Margaret, it's really an honor to be able to talk to you about this. It's really exciting. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna privilege students here. Are there questions from students? A uh, student here at the Kennedy School. I was thinking about the question of local journalism, and what do you think the responsibility of large national publications who do still have the staff, who do have the influence, is to encourage or to support or to fight for local journalism in this age? Mm. Well, that's a great question. I, I, you know, I guess when I think about that through the lens of the two places that I've been, the Washington Post and the New York Times, um, you know, they cannot, it's not possible that they can provide the journalism that all those communities um, can provide. I mean, can they, can they become partners with them in some way? Can there be you know, bundled subscriptions to uh, the Cleveland Plain Dealer and the New York Times. Um, you know, may maybe there are some, some things like that that could be developed. I, you know, I guess I, I'm not sure it is the responsibility of the big newspapers to fix local journalism. Uh, I think we can point it out. You know, I, I, I don't know the answer. I, I really wish I knew the answer to this question because I find it so troubling, but I, I just don't. I'm a uh, junior at the college. Um, so what's been striking to me is how good not only our online networks like Facebook are, but also our offline networks. So friends and social acquaintances are sorting what we see. 
So if there's a big article in The Atlantic, I can basically guarantee that my mom will have seen it. <laughs> but at the same time, my right of center friends, even at Harvard, don't read the Times, don't read the Post, they're basically reading the journal. And then they're sharing the journal with all of each other and with me. So my question for you is, do you think there's any institution or any national media figure who still speaks to a broad, multi-age, multi-partisan national audience? And if there's not, is there likely to be in the future? <laughs> Great question. Um, you know, the, the really troubling thing about this to me is that, and maybe I'm delusional, okay, but I think that places like the Washington Post actually do um, cover things in a way that is intended to and largely does speak to the entire country, but it's seen as being partisan. You know, I have people telling me all the time that I'm uh, part of the DNC's machinery. Um, you know, so, I mean, the journal has, has positioned itself in, a, in an interesting way in that it is seen as pretty centrist. Its editorial pages, however, are, are far from centrist and actually have been, you know, taking some extreme positions um, that are very supportive of Trump and I think reflect the fact that the paper is owned by Rupert Murdoch. So the, the split between the opinion pages and the news pages is, is quite striking. Um, you know, a lot of people did say to me in my effort over the summer that they found National Public Radio to be, to be pretty down the middle. Um, it, not down the middle, but trustworthy. I think that's a better way to say it. Um, but I, I don't know that we can set out to say we're going to try to appeal to everyone. And when we get complaints from the right, we're going to address those. I mean, I think that's the wrong way to go about it. You have to try to do the best work and to come at it in an impartial way on the news pages, you know, not on the editorial pages, not as a columnist. Um, and, you know, do the work as, as best you can and hope that, that, that good journalism um, is recognized and, and perseveres in some way. Joe. Could you tell me? Joe Bauer, I'm on the faculty here. I want to go back to the opening uh, arena. And it, it, it seems to me, in some ways, you can think of what Trump is doing as a reaction to the way the media covers politics. And we have this lovely image, but if you, we, every four years after the election, we target the people who ran the campaigns. And, one of the things that's very clear is they're trying to shape the narrative. And the boys on the bus phenomena, and we know that in election after election, a candidate gets tarred the wrong way and finds it impossible to shake that. Uh, it seems to me what, what, yeah, the, tr the question is, hasn't Trump simply discovered how to bypass the media? And, and, and then the media, bless it, has decided to amplify whatever he has said in his tweets by repeating them. So it's, he found a way of avoiding of what... Yes, and he's the first to, to say that, is that he likes Twitter because it is a direct connection with, um, with America. And he likes that. And, and then you're right. We... Uh, and this is part of not having figured out how to cover him, you know, we find ourselves reacting and in some cases overreacting to his tweets. But you, what I'm also saying is that part of that is you didn't cover other candidates right in the first place. Okay. And that's what... You, well, I guess the question in some sense is, is uh, how do you see Trump... How do you see... Uh, I guess one way of saying this is that is Trump really a symptom or natural conclusion of a very long running, you know, or I'd say actually that a lot of the research has come out of the Shorenstein Center going back to the 19, cover, our analysis of the 1988 presidential campaign. <coughs> if you go back and read the study we published in 1992, 1990, 1990 about the 1988 presidential campaign mm -hmm. and the way the media covered the presidential campaign, its critique is that the media is overly obsessed with polls that, um, that, it, that, it, that it doesn't actually ask substantive questions of the candidates, 
And there's actually a line in there that if this keeps up, a demagogue will end up president. That's why, okay? And, well, look at, okay, yeah, th and uh, there's truth in that for sure. But, you know, there are people who, who say to me all the time, you know, you, you people in the media should have told us more about who Trump was before, before the election. Well, I can tell you this, the Washington Post actually wrote a book about Trump that came out during the election, and it was very good, and it, and it looked at his entire career and his entire history, and we excerpted it in the, in the paper and online. I mean, what do you want? I think people knew, I think people knew who he was, Did and- Did anyone not know enough about him? Well, I mean, if they did, it, it, I mean, the factors that the, the factors that put him in office are are many, and you can you know you can fix on any one of them. Was it what Comey did? You know, yes. Um, you know, was was it any one of these things? And maybe if you take any one of them away, it changes it changes the result. But I mean, look, I don't I don't disagree that the press is a deeply flawed institution, and you know. No question. And, you know, I, at, when I was still at the New York Times, I was fielding a lot of criticism of the way the Times was covering Bernie Sanders' campaign, um, you know, not giving him nearly the attention that Hillary Clinton was getting. And, you know, I, I said that I thought there was some truth to that. Charlie Freifeld, I'm not a student and I'm not on the faculty. Uh, Friend of the center. Um, just offer you a, an idea, a suggestion. Um, you talked about uh, the media somehow getting into a tangle with President Trump, going uh, back and f louder. Uh, you talked about the media getting into a tangle with, <coughs> with President Trump and his tweets, and should you react to the tweets, shouldn't you react to the tweets. Look, President Trump is a person who breaks his promises. I don't think anyone, anyone denies that. How do you deal with a person who breaks his promises? Just in regular life, what would you do if I were someone you had to deal with and I constantly broke my promises? Right, so I think the answer to that in real life is you would try not to have as little to do with right. that person as right. possible. So, so why don't <laughs> but we don't, have that, we don't have that opportunity. So, well, why don't you start by pointing that out and having, uh, inducing the rest of the media to point that out? I think we have pointed that out many, many times. I mean. Many times, and we pointed out in the middle of news articles. I mean, one of my beefs about the critiques of the media is that people are constantly saying, you guys need to do more of this and more of that. And those are things that we're doing all the time. I mean, we are fact-checking, we are pointing out, we are saying, I mean, the New York Times had a front page story the other day about the norms that, that Trump was, was uh, breaking in his relationship with law enforcement agencies. So, you know, I do think could look could they be could that could more of that happen in a different way? I well, agree. Well, maybe let me just so what are what are changes that it seems like that that there there are some changes in the in in the culture and norms of the news of newsrooms that might help. And so I'm just trying to think out loud mm -hmm. for a moment about what they are. I mean. More M more women, yes, that was an easy one. That's an easy one. Um, but, but, but another one would be uh, that uh, in the way we, in the way newsrooms tell stories, right? I mean, in uh, in seeking different, it's, it, it, there's this documented uh, in in research from the center and in the academic research that of only one frame of telling a story, which is which is as a conflict between two sides, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And that there are actually other ways of telling stories, of reporting stories that aren't about a conflict between, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I think that's true. And I also think to the point of the person shouting in the back, um, which I appreciate, um, that that we do have to diversify newsrooms, not Ooh, only- There's Jill Abramson who was shouting from the back. Seriously? More women. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Jill. <laughs> Hi there. Um, I. I do think that newsrooms have to do things differently and that gender diversity is a big part of that, racial diversity is a big part of it, and those aren't the only kinds of diversity that exist. And I will note, since Jill is here, and I mentioned this to you, I guess, earlier, that one of the things Jill did when she was at the Times was quickly move to diversify the masthead so that it was, for the first time in history, half women. 
majority of white women voted for Donald Trump. So tell me how that works, that we want more women. How do you get a group of women who are representative of white women? Because the story of your 13 it's not a It's not a situation in which we're going to put more women there and that's going to change politics. There's no direct line. Yes, introduce yourself. I'm Julia. I'm a student at the college. I'm interested in the comment you made previously about how some journalists move into the social media space and cultivate an identity there. Mm -hmm. So the Pew Research Center found that about two-thirds of adults, U.S. adults, last year go to social media for news. Do you think that the future of journalism is to move into the social media space and try to maintain the principles of journalism there or to recapture those audiences somehow? And if so, uh, what, is, what is the vision for how that might happen? Small yeah, I, 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 I find it hard to kind of get at. Uh, I don't, I don't know how to answer that. It's well, really broad. Let me try and let me try and take a stab at rephrasing the, or just plumbing this issue, which is what, what, what. You, you were talking about journalists having uh, identities on social media right. that can be more snarky or less conform le to a. Not that don't conform to traditional journalism norms and ethics, mm. and uh, given given the role social media plays in the dissemination and distribution of news, you know, do journalists need to be more careful, or wh what are ways journalists can think about their responsibilities on a medium that arguably incentivizes bad behavior? So, I mean, one of the parts of your question that I would like to address is this business of burnishing your brand on social media. Um, and I, I hate that. Um, I think that, y you know, if you, ha the whole idea of reporters having some sort of um, identifiable characteristics uh, as, a, as a Twitter person, uh, you know, rubs me the wrong way. I don't really think that I mean, and that's a little different, I think, for a columnist. But, um, you know, one of the very effective people at the New York Times is Maggie Haberman. I don't find her to, she has a, a very strong presence on social media, but I don't actually find her to be anything except quite um, factually based. It's just that the facts that she, um, that she amplifies in a pointed way are really interesting. So I think perhaps the more we can go down that road and the less of being as you know, obnoxious or as cutting uh, as possible is not such a good path. Me? OK. Hi. Um, I'm Allison Eck. I'm a, a science journalist at PBS. Um, I also interned for the Buffalo News in 2010. I'm from Buffalo. Um, so hi. <laughs> um, I just wanted to know if you could chat a little bit about the role of the public editor and how it's evolving. And you know, not a lot of newspapers have a public editor. How do you see it um, evolving in journalism now? Yeah, I mean, I think that public editors and ombuds men and women are pretty much going away. Um, they, the one at the Washington Post went away several years ago. The one at the New York Times was discontinued just last year. Um, the reasons that are being given for that are that there's so much criticism out there in the social media sphere that um, news organizations can simply find ways to bring that to the surface and respond to them. But I actually don't find that very persuasive um, because as public editor what I tried to do was hear reader complaints and then take them to the decision makers and get answers from the decision makers and then present those with some analysis. Um, that is not something that can happen in this other way. So um, I don't think that every news organization needs to have an ombudsman or a public editor, but I, I did think that the New York Times, because it is singular and um, it is singularly influential, I, I think that it was a helpful thing for readers there. And I'm sorry that they've discontinued it. I think it was a, a, a good thing. Um, I will say, though, in the spirit of complete candor, that when I was at the Buffalo News as editor, my publisher uh, proposed to me the idea that we should have an ombudsman, and I strongly discouraged that <laughs> idea. <laughs> so, but again, you know, I, I think those are two different situations. <laughs> Very different. <laughs> uh, 
Sure, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Defying Coach <coughs> with the uh, fellow with the uh, Shorenson Center. Um, I, uh, I want to shift from, from Trump and, and social media. Um, and I found your, your comment about, uh, about the Me Too movement really fascinating. And what did I say? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think you, I mean, what I, let me just jump to my question, which is that I think the most um, maybe high profile incident recently is involving Aziz Ansari, mm -hmm. and that one was brought forward in an outlet that, uh, babe.net, that um, uh, maybe doesn't have the same, same, uh, Principles that that many of the other, I mean, the New Yorker or the New York Times, does, for example, um, and yet I think that the story has created a massive wave of. I mean, it, it's it's been a very. I mean, many people love the fact that that this happened, um, and I'm wondering what your views are as to, you know, how uh, how these stories can and should come out mm -hmm. and. And um, what sure. what outlets should do to to kind of make make sure that uh, they're telling the truth and, and that that uh, so on and so forth. Yeah. So I think you know one of the things that we should try to do is use people's real names whenever possible, including the accusers. And that has been the strength of some of the best reporting on this is that we're talking about actresses, for example, who have been willing to tell their stories on the record. Um, you know, the Ansari situation was told by, I think, uh, uh, was she named or not? No, she wasn't named. So, you know, I think that's a dividing line. Not to say that we can never use uh, unnamed sources, because in some cases people, you know, really feel that the story is important and if we can get sufficient corroboration, um, then the stories can be told. I mean, look back, uh, again, casting your mind back many years, all the way back to the Roy Moore campaign, um, <laughs> in which you know the Washington Post wrote stories about women who were teenagers at the time. And the strength of that reporting was that there was a woman, Lee Korfman, who was willing to tell her story, which was a nuanced one, um, on the record. So, you know, to me, that's uh, not a, it's not a, a absolute, but it's something very important to, to, to have in mind. And I think we have to have a big picture, uh, we have to remember the big picture here, which is that there are going to be cases in which the punishment doesn't fit the crime very well. And that's, that's not good. Um, but you know, we're in the midst of a big adjustment and a big reckoning, and um, I think that's going to happen. What, uh, let me ask a, a question about sourcing uh, in a different context, which is anonymous sourcing in Washington, D.C. in politics. You know, that there, th I'm constantly astonished. I think it was on Meet the Press this weekend, there was an anonymous quote from a senior intelligence official that was pretty critical of the president, but I, I just, you know, it, it's, it feels like in Washington, D.C., there's an environment that where officials elected and, and uh, but also uh, career public servants don't want to speak openly against the administration on matters of fact, not on matters of opinion. And I wonder the extent to which anonymous sourcing gives outlet to that, but kind of prevents it from getting prevents the truth from getting any purchase. Well, I, I think and have thought for a long time that anonymous sources are overused, way overused. Um, the New York Times had a policy um, articulated by former editor Bill Keller uh, that was in writing that said that anonymous sources should be used only as a last resort, which sounds good and I think is a good idea. And then, you know, you'd pick up the paper and it would be like, wow, there are really a lot of last resorts today. <laughs> So, um, it, you know, there's an addiction in, in Washington to, the, to using anonymous sources. I think that reporters and editors could push much harder to get people on the record because people do want to get their ideas out there and they do want to 
float these things. And if, the, if it's easy to do it anonymously, of course they'll do it that way. If it's not as easy and they might have to put a name behind it, in some cases they will. So I, I, I think that we should be pushing back harder. <laughs> uh, my name is Asad Ramzanali. I am a student here at the Kennedy School. Um, so to go back to the theme of the president <clears throat> as a celebrity, specifically different than a celebrity becoming a president, but the fact that Trump can get to me, the average citizen, directly through Twitter, through YouTube videos, et cetera, um, is that a bad thing? I think we are critical of that in the Trump context, but Obama did that. Um, is it bad that the president, that candidates can talk to citizens directly more now than ever, even if that is a displacement of the media? I mean, I don't know whether it's bad or good. It is a fact of life, and it's not going to go back. And I think that uh, we have to accept it as, <clears throat> as part of how we cover politics now. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't guess I don't feel the need to um, put a value judgment on it. it. It is. And like so many things in the post, you know, in the current sort of digital era, it is, you know, it's like there's no blockbuster video on the corner anymore. And so I think we have to adjust to it. We now know um, that the FBI was looking at Russia meddling in the election and ties to the Trump campaign back in July. Uh, what is your explanation for why there were so few stories anywhere, including in the Times and in the Washington Post? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, what explanation is there? I mean, it's, it's, it's bad stuff. It's, it's something that, you know, when I look back on a story that ran in the Times eight days before the election um, that's come under a lot of scrutiny more recently that had a headline on it that basically said, um, you know, there's nothing to see here uh, between Trump and, and Russia. And that's a little bit overstated and perhaps a little unfair, but that that was the impression you could get from the headline, which did essentially reflect the story. Um, I think that created an impression that we know now, is, you know, it doesn't correspond to reality. Um, I mean, I don't know the answer to, to why that was the case. I think that some of it was that the way the election was being covered was to make sure that Hillary Clinton was getting a great deal of scrutiny because she was going to be the president. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is where the whole false equivalency thing <coughs> enters into things. And so Trump, who a lot of journalists still weren't taking completely seriously and couldn't believe in some ways could actually become the president because he just couldn't be, um, you know, got off a little lighter. Yeah. My name is Eugene Zhou. I'm a prospective student here. I applied for the, the Mason Fellow, uh, Fellow program this year. And uh, uh, my question is about uh, the, the role of the journalist in the campaign. Um, because I, re um, I read some books about uh, their journalism. Some journalists, uh, they thought they shouldn't give too much time to Donald Trump. Because it, even you are, when you are criticizing this person, but uh, in fact, a, the process helped President uh, the Trump mm -hmm. to be the president. Mm -hmm. sure. But uh, um, if you didn't give too much time to Trump, or you gave more time to other candidates, maybe it's even for every candidate. So uh, my question is, uh, um, have you ever think about uh, the role of the journalist? They should be, um, there should be a, a regulation about how much time you can give uh, every candidate that should be fair to everyone. <laughs> so um, I do think, you know, to answer the substance of your question, um, I do think that journalists, or at least the media, gave a great deal of um, free exposure to Trump, particularly during the primary. I mean, CNN would broadcast his empty podium. And, you know, Trump was driving 
ratings and driving readership. Uh, he calls himself a ratings machine, and in fact, that is true. You know, e even now, um, a headline with with the word Trump in it, you know, will generate. He's he, people are fascinated. They may be fascinated in a in a very in a way that's you know they're repelled, mm -hmm. but but they're fascinated. Um, you know, should there be some sort of re I, I, I'm. I don't know the answer to the, the question about regulation. I mean, I, I tend to not want the government regulating how journalists do business, and I think that there's probably more trouble down that road than salvation. I don't think that regulation should be come from government, but uh, for the journalists themselves. We're not very good at making those kinds of agreements with each other. <laughs> That would suggest that we can all get along and you know come to some reasonable conclusions. Well, there's no reason to think that's the case. Please join me in thanking yeah. Margaret Sullivan for her excellent time here with us. Buried among the revelations in the indictment against former Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort is the fact that he paid almost a million dollars to an antique rug store in Alexandria. Everything else about the story is also amazing, but I do not want to lose sight of this carpet. <laughs> <laughs> you go on to imagine how he went to spend that kind of money on the carpet. I think, because every so often you still have to have joy in your life.